So every so often, a movie comes out where I sit down, I watch it, think about it for a second, and go, the hell was that? Such is the subject of today's video, The Crow 2024. <laughs> What's going on and welcome to Joe's Geek Show, the video series where we talk comics and sometimes movies. So The Crow 2024 is the new Crow movie from Lionsgate. It stars Bill Skarsgård, Danny Houston, and FKA Twigs. And this film is an adaptation of James O'Barr's graphic novel of the same name. Let's dive in. To start, this movie takes way too long to get going. A good portion of the movie is dedicated to the development of Shelley and Eric's relationship and you think that would be good development but instead it just made the movie so damn boring it was hard to get invested because i just also didn't buy the love story very much here i mean you got two people they instantly meet and then boom sparks fly the romance just seems to be instantaneous i mean they're together what a week maybe two after they're on the run couple of months and just the way the scenes are shot and conveyed it looks more like a summer fling than an actual romance i mean they're like you know, frolicking through the open fields and partying and drinking and getting high together on various substances. Okay, yeah, so I'm just pointing out that Eric was actually in rehab. Yeah, Shelly got herself caught by the police and they happened to put her in rehab and she was kind of using that as a bit of a hideout, I guess. But he was legitimately there and we don't know how long he was there for. And almost immediately after escaping and they get to Shelly's friend's penthouse, the first thing she really does is just giving him alcohol and drugs. Because nothing screams love like self-destructive behavior. There just seems to be these moments on Shelly's face where she looks kind of bored. Like Eric is looking at her all lovingly and fearingly and she just has this just blankless expression like she doesn't really want to be there now of course i'm sure this wasn't the general point of the film itself and it just could be bad direction which leads into this next section the acting isn't really all that great in this movie despite having a pretty decent cast the acting is very subpar like you can tell that the actors just they don't have much to chew on in the scenery bill i think does pull down the best performance of the entire movie as the title character but even still i've seen plenty of bill skarsgård performances this is one of his weaker ones and danny huston just kind of phones it in i mean he sits back and talks in a deep ominous voice as well, Danny Huston does, and he's just very one note as a villain. I mean, scene wise, he doesn't have very many scenes in the movie. He pretty much shows up for exposition and to inform the audience that, yeah, he is still in the movie. But I will admit, anytime that Danny Huston's character uses his powers in the movie, which is to be able to like whisper into somebody's ear and get them to do stuff not unlike the purple man from the jessica jones show but he just approaches really slowly at first and then just sort of like dives right into their ear and almost looks like he's chewing their ear like i get this is maybe supposed to be creepy but i chuckled almost every single time he did this sort of like i got something to tell you <laughs> and oh yeah there is a supernatural element to this movie outside of the crow itself it is explained that danny huston's character effectively made a deal with the devil to make him immortal as long as he's feeding him souls and for most of danny huston's character's life it's been just him with no other opposition so when eric shows up as the crow and he hears hey here's a guy who can't die you think there would be a bigger conflict because this would be danny huston's character for like maybe the first time in his however long he's been alive making contact and coming at odds with, at the very least, an equal force. In fact, Danny Huston's character is defeated pretty easily, all things considered. I mean, you think it would be a bigger battle, but it really wasn't. I mean, there was like a brief moment where he temporarily subdues Eric, but that lasts all of 10 seconds, which makes the subduing a little bit pointless. In fact, that's one thing this movie does do is sometimes it brings up these 
certain little elements and you think, oh, this is going to factor into the plot in a big way, but almost immediately after its introduction, it's resolved. Like when Eric temporarily loses his powers because he doubted Shelly's love for, I guess, a couple of minutes. But not more than five minutes later, he's, he's back and he's ready to go. And again, there's that thing about like the pain and how much it actually hurts to heal, but after he, I guess, fully embraces the crow, that kind of stuff is no longer seen for the rest of the movie. So that one aspect that could have brought just a little bit more tension to the fights is no longer there. I mean, the film is just sort of throwing things around at times and never really takes the time to establish any rules because anytime we get some rules, they're void not too long after. But like when you watch a movie, you want to be able to suspend your disbelief. One of the ways to do this is for the film to set up rules about how everything works. And as long as the rules are present and they stick to them, everything is smooth sailing. But when you break those rules or start throwing random stuff there in the final act, it breaks my immersion. I'm no longer able to suspend my disbelief because now it's okay, rules are out the window. Next up, characters in this movie just make really bad decisions. Like when it comes to Shelly getting herself arrested for drug possession to be able to escape a guy following her. I mean, she just could have easily have walked up to the cops and say, hey, this guy behind me, he's been following me. But I guess she thought getting arrested would be easier and She's honestly kind of lucky that they decided to throw her into rehab for drug possession because he could have easily have just ended up in jail. And if Danny Houston's character has, you know, more connections and stuff, she would have been completely cornered in a jail cell. Then, of course, when Shelly and Eric are on the run and Shelly's first idea is, let's go hide out at my friend's house. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was hiding from people that wanted to kill me, the last place I would go would be people that I actually know. Because I'm sure there's some way that the bad guys could ascertain the information about Shelly's inner circle. And also taking camping trips and going partying at raves. That's perfect. Probably the one place the bad guys won't find her, out in the open at a club. Also at the rehab facility, allowing males and females to cohabitate is a little strange. I mean, typically, even if it's the same hospital, they would be kept completely apart in two different wings, yet the women, I guess, were just sort of walking around the facility like it's nothing. I mean, she was even in Eric's room, and I have a feeling in a real facility that would be a big no-no. And she's not even sneaking. She's freely walking around. Eric even makes a mention that they're not really supposed to sit together during lunch, but does it anyway, and but he says anything. Like I said, I can only suspend my disbelief so much. And then there was the ending of the movie, which didn't really work for me too much. Like, what the hell was that even? Because, I mean, given how it ends, we've got two possible scenarios here. One, Shelly is brought back to the moment she died, which means we're kind of looking at the rules of time travel here, most likely, which means if Shelly awoken at that certain point, what about everyone else that Eric had killed up to that point? Were they just sort of like Thanos snapped from the timeline? Do they meet unfortunate ends in different ways like car accidents? Or are they still kind of running around and she's still in danger? Or two, given the idea with Kronos being one of the paramedics that brought Shelly back, you also have the possibility that Eric and Shelly being drug addicts just OD'd and the entire movie took place in her mind as she was drifting off to death before getting resuscitated. I also found the editing to be quite choppy in a few different places here. I mean, I'm sitting there, I'm watching the movie, scene happens, then the next scene happens and the cut is so hard. I had to wonder, was this a scene that was like shot at another time or reshot and just sort of like squeezed into the movie? Because the flow and pacing of this movie is horrendous. And this movie seems to be a mishmash of interesting ideas sewn together to create an incomprehensible mess that fails to entertain and reignite what made the original so endearing. And now to further highlight the points, we will be taking a look at the original graphic novel as a basis for comparison. So the Crow graphic novel deals with themes of love, death, and revenge, and is a very visceral and emotional reading experience that 
Even if you can't relate to it, you can empathize with it. Because this story in and itself was born out of tragedy, as creator James O'Barr created this book as a way to cope with the tragedy of having lost his fiance. He poured all of his pain and anguish into this book, and it shows. This invites the audience to go on this journey with Eric as he's enacting his vengeance and cluing us in as to what happened along the way, so that by the time we experience the actual death of Eric and Shelly, we are already so wrapped up and invested in the story that we want nothing more than to see these two happy, but that's not what happens. And this just brings a higher gravity to the overall reading experience so that by the time you get to that final page and you put it down and you're able to just kind of think about it for a moment, there's sort of this internal struggle about how I should even be feeling about the book. Because part of what makes the story so tough to handle is just how Eric and Shelly get killed. This just isn't a standard shoot them in their dead scenario. This is a complete destruction of innocence for no reason at all other than just wrong place, wrong time. It's a scene that really highlights how monstrous people can be. Because here you have this gang and they just do some of the most unspeakable things imaginable. And then they go on with their life like nothing ever happened. Also, this movie just gives away too much. Where the original is that slow discovery, this is a movie that lays all of its cards on the table, removes any form of subtlety, and takes the guesswork out of the experience. I mean, this movie really takes its time to explain almost every single last thing. By the seven minute mark, we know everything about our villain, and so each consecutive scene with that character gives us nothing really new to learn about him. And this is something I do see pop up in a lot of modern movies where, the directors and filmmakers, they're just so scared that nobody's gonna get what's going on, that they just have to explain everything in these giant exposition dumps. Also, the film gave a clear-cut reason as to why Eric and Shelly were killed. It's because Shelly had a video of Danny Huston's character in a room with her and I guess other friends when Danny told Shelly to kill another girl. Tragic, sure, but giving motive automatically undermines the purpose of the original story. Whereas the original graphic novel is just rich with various characters, of course there are the villains, which are wild crazy caricatures with no real depth but lots of personality. That makes them memorable. I will always remember Tintin, Fun Boy, T-Bird, Top Dollar, and so on. This allows the villains to stand out more and gives a higher sense of satisfaction when they are taken out. The 2024 movie, however, everyone under Danny Huston are basically just henchmen 1, 2, and 3. I don't even remember their names. There's no standouts, no personality with the characters, so when they meet their end, it's no different than the nameless guards. Then back to the original graphic novel, we have characters like Officer Albright, and Sherry. Although brief, these characters allow us to see the human side of Eric as he tries to impart both wisdom and comfort that will hopefully allow them to see the beauty in life and just maybe they can find happiness again. These scenes are deeply poetic and simultaneously inspiring. We have none of that here. We never really get to see the human side of him or experience his kindness and understanding towards others other than Shelly. Closest thing we get is at one point he decides not to kill a friend of Shelly's, but it's so brief and lacks that emotional punch I was looking for. The deeply poetic nature is no longer intact. Then, once again, we are going to bring up the ending. So again, in the graphic novel, once Eric has done his job, he and Shelly are reunited in spirit, which gives the reader a small glimmer of joy that at the very least, these two can now rest in peace together. The 2024 ending just strips that away completely because this movie allows Shelly to come back to life while Eric is damned for eternity. There is no reward for a sacrifice, no eternal rest, but she gets to go on and live her life, which on its own would be fine in a different movie, but that's just not The Crow. It's such a loose adaptation, other than picking out a couple of panels from the comic that made it into the movie, it's almost unrecognizable. Now, I have no doubt that the director read this story, loved this story, and wanted to make a movie that he felt best reflected the material. But he thought the way to do that was to change everything. Intentions can be good, but if you lack the proper understanding of what it is you are adapting, you are doomed to fail. As George R.R. Martin once said, the book is the book, the film is the film. They will tell you as if they were saying something profound. Then they make the story their own. They never make it better though. 999 times out of a thousand, 
they make it worse. The amount of liberties taken with this story and characters removes any real recognizability from long-term readers and fans. This movie carries neither the spirit nor passion of what made the original graphic novel or 1994 movie the success they were. This was a film that attempted to subvert and redefine The Crow more likely so that it can be a franchise and have sequels, as Hollywood has been wanting from this series. I think this will be one of those Crow films that over time will get bundled in with the other sequels and be largely disregarded and forgotten. And that is my take on The Crow 2024 movie. But now I'm curious, what did you think about this movie? Did you actually like it? If so, what did you like about it or what you didn't like about it? Please tell me your thoughts in the comment section below. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button, share it with some friends, subscribe if you're not subscribed already, and ring that notification bell for more comic book content. And if you're wondering what to watch next, consider one of these two videos. All right, take care, have a great day, and as always, stay geeky.